Hello and welcome to your Living A Course in Miracles call. My name is Jared Krebs. Today is March 15th, 2024, and we have a special guest tonight, Nancy Reed, who is a Course in Miracles expert. She has an incredible story, and she also wrote a book called Happily Ever Now. And I am so excited to have you on this call, Nancy. Um, before I Before I bring you on to share your story, I want everyone to know a little bit about you and Number one, she comes from a Course in Miracles family. Her mom and stepdad uh, worked directly with Ken Wapnick when he was in New York, like before he moved to California. So like back in the day, and Nancy was a teen. And so she kind of grew up in this environment, not really knowing so much about a course, and then went through an incredible uh, transformation. I'll let her sh share all the details with you, but you're going to want to uh, just pay attention because it's it's awesome. And since then, since since all of this spiritual awakening has happened, she's also written this written this book, Happily Ever Now, that's now a number one new release on Amazon, has won seven or more, actually eight awards, three first place gold medals, was featured on the NASDAQ Jumbotron board in Times Square because she won all these awards. Like, so I'm just blown away by that. And she also has a clubhouse channel. So if you want to um, get on those those calls, that's how Leasley found you, Nancy. And so I wanna give a big thank you to Leasley Wallon for bringing you here because it wasn't for Leasley, we would not have you here. So it's a big honor. Um, so again, without further ado, everybody get on your feet, give all the hearts and snaps to Nancy Reed. Hi, everybody. Oh, thank you for the heart. Oh, okay, I'll give you a heart back. <laughs> wow, nice hearts. Did you see that? Yeah, Does make your you little Taylor Swift heart. Oh, my God. Okay, goals. <laughs> well, Nancy, uh, you know, we just want to kind of hear your story uh, from, I guess you could say, from when you were that teenager who knew nothing about the course through uh, mm -hmm. this entire journey that you've been on. And uh, I mean, I can tell that not only have you really put the time into the, the metaphysics of the course, but also living the course. And mm -hmm. that is just evident from talking to you. So I'm just really excited to hear your story and, and take it away. Thank you so much. Wow. What an opportunity. So yes, I grew up in a family that definitely was very quote unquote spiritual, whatever that means, right? And my grandmother was very involved with Edgar Casey and the uh, you know Association for Research and Enlightenment. And my mother kind of followed in her footsteps as well. And then through my grandmother, my mother actually heard about this thing called A Course of Miracles. And she and my stepfather got to meet Ken Wapnick when he was very early on introducing A Course of Miracles to kind of everybody. And it was something that we always had the quote unquote blue book in our house, but I never opened it. It was just something that was, you know, sort of there. And I used to even be like to my mom, like, mom, what do I even say you do? You, you go to these classes every summer and like, you talk about watching these beavers on the pond and like in this beautiful thing and, and Roscoe and everything. And, and you come back and, you know, you guys go to these classes and you, you kind of try to tell me a little bit about them, but I don't really understand and you're telling me that it's not the Bible, but that there's some things that are sort of similar to it. And we weren't like religious or anything. And so, you know, there were all these questions that I had, but they were also sort of like that. Well, I know that if I start asking them that I'm just going to keep going too. And I also wanted to just be kind of this normal kid too, you know, and I was, I was a little girl who came into this world who seemed to know things that I couldn't explain and nobody else could explain. I was always highly empathic and high, highly intuitive. Um, those words were not really thrown around as much when I was little. And so basically I just did my best to not be weird or different. And I <laughs> got really good at hiding in plain sight and, and using my natural sense of intuition and empathy to become different versions of myself for whoever was in front of me so that I could hide because I was so worried about being, you know, kind of quote unquote exposed as this different type of kid. 
So, you know, that's definitely the reluctancy that I had about embracing anything spiritual, about embracing anything that was, you know, out of the box or or I did so well at kind of blending in the background and used to actually want to have my superpower be invisibility. Because then I thought nobody would notice me because people just tended to notice me. They would come up to me like on the street when I'd be with my dad or something like that in San Francisco growing up. I remember this woman came up and she was like, oh, your daughter has this beautiful aura and all these things. And I was like, ah, I just want to be a normal kid. Like, you know, so I was really, really, really reluctant for all of that. Right. So that just lays the background for that. We had these people come to our house every week for study groups that my mom and my stepdad led. And we had these books around the house and every once in a while, I would kind of hear these tape recordings that my mom would have of this man with a very, very, very strong, you know, New York accent. And I'd be like, how do you, what, what is he even saying? And and then she would turn it off and, and she'd be like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, it, it's okay. And, and so anyways, I got through life and I grew up and I went off to college and I graduated from college and I found myself one night in this date that I was very excited about going on because the guy was really cute. And by that point in my life, I had done such a good job at distancing myself from listening to that inner voice, from listening to that intuition, from all those knowings that I had as a child. And I had become so good at blending in the background and hiding in plain sight. And so that voice told me not to get in the car with this guy on the date. And I didn't listen to her. And I got in the car and very soon afterwards, I realized that my mistake because it turned out that he'd been drinking and I didn't know it. And so the car started, you know, going faster and faster and faster. I asked him to go slower and he was like, yes, after we get around this next corner. And we never made it around that next corner. So the car hit some gravel and he braked really hard and it started spinning basically. And we ended up going over this cliff. And as we were going over the cliff and I was the passenger in the car, it was this old fashioned sports car. And so the seatbelts were not self-adjusting and the person that had ridden in it at, before me was much larger. And so as we were going over the edge and I'm listening now to this inner voice that told me not to get in the car and, and I'm hearing it say, push up. And so I took my arm and I wedged it into the roof of the car so that I was like holding myself as we went over the edge. And that kept me from hitting the dashboard or going through the windshield. So that was that was a crucial thing. But it also injured my right AC joint in my shoulder and it twisted my whole thoracic spine. So all of that was happening. And as all that was happening, I also had this sense of what people with near-death experiences call a life review where I saw all of my life to that point, almost like a, a like a movie role or something like that, like I was watching it and it was playing out in front of me. And the only things that I saw were any moments where there was intentional or unintentional unkindness, either you know from me or from the relationship that I was in and the dynamics that we were in. Um, or some kind of unhealed or, you know, resentment basically. And I was like, why am I being shown this? Like out of everything I'm going to see before I die, this is the last thing <laughs> and, and, and how odd. And yet there was also this part of me that was like, pay attention, that there's something here. And so as we went over the edge and I literally thought that I had died because we landed quite a few feet down from the main road and the window was rolled down a little bit. So all this dirt came in and I was like literally buried. And when I realized I was not dead, I heard to get out of the car from that same inner voice. And so I crawled out of the car and I started making my way up the hill back to the road. And by this point it was pitch dark and didn't have any cell phone reception or anything. And so we get to the surface and that's a whole rescue in and of itself. And that's detailed in my book. But basically what happened was that I was injured. I did hurt my shoulder. I did hurt my thoracic spine, but everything else on me pretty much looked okay. Like if you just looked at me from the surface and you weren't really paying attention to my shoulder, you didn't really see the injuries on the outside. And yet inside I was a complete mess. I was a wreck. And so I was having terrible PTSD, post-traumatic stress, and I was having nightmares where the driver's faces 
in the car would change each nightmare. And one night, the face changed to my own. And that's when I recognized, oh, that's right. I did hear not to get in that car. And I did it anyways. And so, you know, what, what do I do with this information? And oh, what was I shown again? Why, why was I shown that? What could be the purpose of that? I wonder. And so I got up out of bed and I'd been given this journal a few months before. And it said on the cover, awaken from the dream within. And so I opened it up and I started writing. And my first entry was called The Instant is All There Is. And basically it was reminding me that the past is gone, that all we have is now. And that there was nothing I could do to make God love me less or more, that I was already with him. And it was very odd for me to be writing this. This was not something that I normally would write. And, and yet there was this sense of it being a memory rather than something new. And, and so I continued to write. And then what I noticed was that my pain lessened as I wrote and my anxiety lessened and I was able to sleep much, much, much better. And so I just, you know, wrote this very short entry, like about a page or so. And then I put down my pencil and I just went back to bed. And then I did this for several days afterwards. And so about two weeks into doing this, just, you know, very gentle sort of journaling for myself, I decided to show them to my mother. And I was like, you know, mom, I don't know why, but I feel like I'm supposed to show you these. And so I gave them to her and she was reading them and she was like, wow, you wrote these? These are really beautiful and lovely. And I said, yeah, they've been really helpful. And what's really weird is that my shoulder doesn't hurt as much after I, I write and I'm sleeping a little better. And she was like, oh, well then keep writing. And then she said, is it okay if I show these to somebody? And I was like, yeah, sure, go ahead. Maybe they'll help somebody else, you know? <laughs> and, and so then she shared them with a friend of hers that was working with Ken Wapnick at Foundation for a Course in Miracles. And so by that point, they had relocated to Temecula in California, which is the same state that I'm in. And I'm in Northern California though. So he was down in Southern California, but they shared him my entries. And then a couple of weeks after that, I got a phone call when I was at my mom's in, in her kitchen. I'll still remember this. And I'm sitting down at her like orange Formica counter and the phone rings and she's like, it's for you. And I'm like, well, okay, who, who, who even knows that I'm here right now visiting you? And it was Ken. And he was like, hey, you know, is this the famous Nancy or something? And I was like, huh? Uh, yeah, this is she. And he's like, oh, this is Ken Wapnick. He's like, I'm a friend of your mom's. And I've been reading your journals and they're beautiful. And and he's he's like, what do you think about all this? And I was like, well, I'm not really sure. Like, you know, it's a little overwhelming, but there's also this like peace that I feel when I'm writing. And he said, oh, that's great. He's like, yeah, don't make a big deal about this. Don't take it too seriously. And he said, and if you trust me at all, he's like, you don't have to, but if you do, he's like, here's my phone number. You can call me anytime you want. Send me anything you write. Here's my fax at the time, right? And, and then he said, oh, and make me one promise. And I was like, okay. So I just trusted him implicitly from the first conversation. And he said, just promise me you won't read any other spiritual text, particularly that blue book that your mom has. And it's only right when you feel that you want to. Don't force it, don't anything else, and don't take it too seriously. And I was like, okay, sure, I can do that. And so, you know, another six months or so went by. And in that time, I was writing whenever I felt that it was the thing to do. And it was always very gentle and very like healing to me. And I was beginning to sleep a little better. My shoulder was getting a little better. I found Pilates, which also ended up helping to heal my shoulder. And so all these things were unfolding. And then I was sharing every time I wrote, I would send the entry to Ken and then he and I would talk about it. And I was having these really lucid dreams too. And he was really good at walking me through dreams and so I was sharing him, you know, the different things that I was seeing. And then about six months later, he called me and he said, okay, today's the day. And I was like, well, okay, what do you mean? And he said, today's the day. If you want to take out that blue book, you can open it. And I was like, okay, sure. So I got the blue book and I had it in my hands. And I was like, what do I do? Where do I even open it to? He's like, you'll know. And then I just opened the book. And the first page I came to was 
the forgotten song. And that was my first recognition that there was definitely a parody between what I was remembering and writing and what was written. And so I was like, but how is that even possible, Ken? And he said, well, here's the thing. He's like, truth is true. And he said, so what you're experiencing is a slightly different form, but it's coming from that same place and that same intention. And he said, I'd love to meet you. Please come to one of my classes and, you know, let, let's, let, let's, let's get to know each other better. And I was like, okay, yes, I'll sign up for a class. <laughs> and so it wasn't too long after that, I made my way down to Temecula. And that was the beginning of our beautiful friendship, which lasted until he passed away in 2013. Wow, that's so <laughs> awesome, man. I mean, I can only imagine like talking to Ken and being his friend because I didn't even start studying the course till 2014. <laughs> and so I was a little late for, for Ken, but man, if I was, I would have totally gone to Temecula if, if I was in the right time, time zone or time frame. but uh, to hear this story is very inspiring. So what year was it that you went there? First? So I met him in 2002. 2002. So mm -hmm. for 11 years, you were basically... Mm -hmm talking to Ken all the time, going to mm -hmm. Temecula, being in the energy. You probably, were you at some of those videos that we watch where he's doing the journey through the text or journey Pro through the I workbook? mean, pro probably. I always sat in the very back because I was one of the youngest people that was there. Uh, and so I always felt like that, you know, I wasn't, I don't know, like I hadn't earned my stripes yet or something, even though he would tell me that was just silly. But, yeah. um, but, and then when I would go like with my mom or my stepdad too, we'd have lunch with him and Gloria and oh my God. You know, hang out with them and everything. And I mean, he couldn't have been just more kind and more wonderful, more loving. And he was somebody that from the moment he saw you, he did see you like mm -hmm. you felt seen and, and, and totally just, Yeah. I learned so much from him and I still talk to him like every day. I listen to his recordings every day. Like, you know, I mean, so I don't feel like that that connection is gone, but it certainly has shifted, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the form it, itself. But, but he was such a demonstration to me of mm -hmm. kindness, like deliberate, pure, timeless kindness and so that definitely registered from the first conversation that we had, because that was what I was shown in that experience of going over the edge. And so kindness has always been my, you know, mission, vision, whatever you want to say. And, and, and my experience of Ken was just that he was the most anti-guru that you could ever have imagined. And, and, and he was so approachable and so loving and yet so brilliant and so just in the moment. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I've i never met anybody else like him and I'm not sure I ever will necessarily, but but it's it's something that I am so grateful that I trusted that voice within me, that, that memory, you know, really to begin that writing and then to show them to my mother and then to have all of it kind of come, you know, full circle was just such a gift. Absolutely. And is the writings that you first started to to do, are they available somewhere? Is that a separate book or is that part of your book? I have never shared them publicly. I do share one entry in the book, um, The Happily Ever Now, mm -hmm. from those original writings but I have never actually published them. I've had several people ask me over the years now that they've seen the book and, you know, everything like that to share the actual journal itself, which is, I think it's like 150 entries or something like mm -hmm. that, or, you know, 200 entries or something like that. And, uh, cause I, it went on for several, several years, mm -hmm. um, that I was doing it and it definitely was something that was very helpful to me personally. But I guess I never felt the need to to share it with anybody else. But the few people that I have shared them with over the years, they're always like, oh, wow, these are really comforting. You know, yeah. they're, they're really gentle. Oh, beautiful. Well, I'm sure if if and when you decide to share them, everyone will 
will want to get them because your story is so <laughs> awesome. And, uh, you know, I would be very intrigued to read them because I would want to see how, how close they are to the course. And then knowing your backstory of having no knowledge of the course, and you're just basically <laughs> going and writing this great information. So, um, that's, that's so awesome. And, um, so you went through this and obviously you became a student of the course. I mean, you're hanging out mm -hmm. with Ken, you're going to Temecula, you're reading probably the course every day, you're probably doing journey through the text or what, you know, like things Ken has, right? Yeah. But like, how does that transition into happily ever now and your current book? And like, like, how did you get from the course to, I guess, that part of your life? Well, so the biggest demonstration that I ever saw from Ken was that it is possible to be here, but not of here, right? So that you're operating mm. as though everybody else and that it's it's really like his book two plus two equals five. It's It's that same idea that you learn how to show up and be you as a normal person in a normal job, a normal life, a normal, you know, all these things. And, and so you learn that two plus two equals four, and you learn all the ways that that is true according to the world. And yet in your mind, you are operating from the knowledge that two plus two equals five. And so therefore you're coming from expansion rather than limitation. You're coming from certainty that salvation isn't something that's coming and so there's no urgency. It's rather something that you're accessing and remembering is already present as now. Woo. So that book's called two plus two equals five. Mm -hmm. And that's like one of Ken's like, like pamphlets or his or like what, little, or, like, I'm trying to yeah. see if I even have it here. Um, I only have his laughing flowers close to me right now, but it's on my bookshelf somewhere, <laughs> but well, yeah, it's, it's like a little like green book. And it, it's like, I think it either is like exactly when two plus two equals five or something. It's like a chalkboard is on mm -hmm. the cover and, um, it's a very, very, very short, simple book. It might even only be like 80 pages or something like that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of his, his, his books, you know, were not so dense. Some of them were like, um, certainly love does not condemn is, is a very big and absence from Felicity is, is, is very, very rich and very dense, but some of them were much shorter and, um, more like taken from the Academy classes that he would do. And then I think later on, they, they would turn them into the books too. Yeah. Yep. A hundred percent. That's the, the journey through the text and the journey through mm -hmm. the workbook. So I, I don't know if you saw about our group, but we study Ken Wapnick's journey through, um, well, we've done the entire journey through the text. 30 mm -hmm. minutes at a time. And it took us like three or four years to go through all three <laughs> what chapters. Um, but we've been meeting every Friday for like seven years or something. Like our group is cool. Like everybody like studies Ken every week. So we're eating this up, by the way. This is so cool. Uh -huh. And and um the two plus two equals five has always been something I've struggled with because as a a businessman who knows that I need to have a positive mindset. I need to have good energy. I need to do things like affirmations and, and things that are like about idols, you know, and then, and then like feeling guilt about it. Like, Oh, I'm not this great course student because I'm so focused on this, but no, Ken says, be normal, you know, yeah. and, and just look and do it, watch yourself do it without judgment. And like go through, and I've, I've kind of gotten to a point where I can accept that. Right. And that I, I'm, and, and it's cool to hear what you're saying about, and that's why I want to hear the two plus two equals five or, or get that, that book, because it sounds like he speaks to that, that concern or that question, but also you're living that. So now you have mm -hmm. this book happily ever now. I think what you just said about, um, accessing peace now, like God's peace, which cannot be given by making a, a, all the money or having all the goals or finding the right partner or all whatever we want from this world. We already have the peace now. And yeah. then everything comes from, from there. Like, like that's the, I guess that's really the, the best part about it. Right. Because then you, you operate from this, this happy place of abundance and, and fulfillment. And, um, so tell us about Happily Ever Now and how did you get to that part of uh for this book? And then of course it won all these awards. So it must it must be good. Um, and then I want everyone to know where they can get it too. Do you have a copy? Do you have something handy of the book? Oh, there it is. Can you hold it a little closer? 
There we go. Happily ever now, not after okay. everything else is perfect. Ooh, I like that last part. Okay. So it's a gentle guide for overcoming the paralysis of perfectionism by embracing our innate guidance. Okay. And, you know, so it's, it's really about, it's my story of that so much of my life, like I was saying, with having this highly intuitive self and, you know, empath self, that so much of my life was about trying to be perfect. It was trying to fit into this box because I thought that if I could be perfect, that that meant that I was kind of off the hook too, like, you know, for, for everything else. And, and I especially had this addiction to giving away my power of decision. And mm -hmm. so this is where A Course in Miracles really, really, really resonates with me, right? Because for so long, there was this belief within me that if I gave away my power to choose to someone else, then that meant that I was off the hook for the outcome and that I got to maintain my innocence, right? And, and that they were the guilty party. They were the ones that forced me. I was just the sweet little thing over here and, you know, everything. And so my relationship with Ken and studying with him and practicing and living really what his core message always was, is that when I recognized my pattern and my attachment and attraction to that, I could look at it without judgment. I could look at it fully because if I can't see it all, then I can't heal it all. If there's any part of it that I'm denying, and if I'm denying the denial of my decision to choose, then what I'm really doing is I'm maintaining my innocence at everyone else's expense, right? And, and, and so it, this is an all or nothing course. So it's either that we're all in with the ego or we're all in with our Holy Spirit. We can't have one hand holding on to each. So if we're in with the ego and we recognize that that's what we're choosing and we don't judge it, then it's as though we've dropped the hand of the ego and we've gently reached out for that hand of the Holy Spirit, right? So if we're able to look at our choices and see them, as neutral rather than good or bad, because that's the thing that my relationship with Ken really allowed me to see differently is that a healthy body is no better or worse than an unhealthy body in the fact that both the healthy body and an unhealthy body are unreal. That's what makes them the same. Now, certainly I can have my preferences and certainly I can have preferences for those around me to be healthy. But if I've given away my peace to something occurring or not occurring outside of me, then what I've done is I've given the power to the one thing that can never give me peace or take it away, which is the decision to take that tiny mad idea that separation seriously, right? And so instead, if I can remember that if it was remembering not to laugh, that's what got us here, quote unquote, you know, in, in this, <laughs> in this ridiculousness, then it's going to be me taking it lighter and no, that doesn't mean blissing out. It doesn't mean bypassing. It doesn't mean denying, but it does mean looking with a lighter lens at my choices and at those around me too. And again, that comes from resting in that certainty that salvation isn't something that I'm striving for or that I need to get all these other people to join me and be good Course in Miracles students or that even what is that? What is a good Course in Miracles student? Well, good Course in Miracles student is not to judge when you resist wanting to, to study your Course in Miracles or that somebody else has a different way of studying it too, you know? It's, it's that when we instead go back to our own self-study of this curriculum, yes, we can do it in a group. Yes, we can do it together as one or not at all, but we also don't want to allow 
A Course in Miracles or any other spiritual thought system, because this is a Course in Miracles. It's not the Course in Miracles, right? So, so, so that whatever we're giving our power to, we want to still maintain that we're always talking about the level of the mind and the level of cause, because if we're focused on the effects, then we're actually denying where the real cause seemingly is, even though there is no actual problem. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh, honestly, I'm I'm really glad that you're here sharing right now. I think a lot of these things you're saying are landing really well for me personally. Like like um, just the um, the idea of not judging yourself when you're judging, or like you see yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, making the decision and then saying, oh, I'm being really hateful right now. And then just looking at it and then just laughing in your, or like not judging basically at mm -hmm. what happened. Like just all those things are so valuable and and clearly your, your ability to um, articulate the metaphysics of the course is uh, second to none. I love how you said everything and I'm going to definitely re-listen re to this recording. But uh Thank you for for what you've said and and for um, sharing these these concepts because we need to hear them and we need to hear them over and over. And um, I do want to make sure that uh, we have some time for questions. We have a lot of people on this call. I want to give a shout out to Steve Klein, my dear friend from Oklahoma, who's watching. Good to see you, Steve, as well. And uh, so. Uh, if you have a question for Nancy, uh, feel free to raise your hand, hit the raise your hand button. But also, Nancy, is there anything else you want to share? I mean, uh, specifically about your book or where they can find your book or some of your, like, your website, your clubhouse? Like, um, how can people uh, get more of this great stuff you're, ta you're talking about? I'll leave up. <laughs> yeah, they can find my book at happilyevernowbook.com. They can also just go on Amazon and and find it there and i do have a page where it's directly to my links like my main like vip links for everything so you can find my website you can find any of my offers you can find all of my socials you can connect with me within clubhouse and uh, like uh, listly found me as well and uh so i can either share that i don't know if you want me to copy it into the chat here or send it to you as a separate link but i do have that and i'm happy to share that can 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 you say it so people watching can get it? And we'll yes. So let me okay. let me be certain that I'm saying it correctly. So hold on a okay. second here. Okay. okay. So <laughs> so if you go to h t t p s colon backslash backslash, and then it's the number thirty two favors f a v like Victor o r s dot com. And then do a backslash with my name, Nancy, N-A-N-C-I hyphen read, R-E-E-D. Those are my VIP links. And 32 Favors is a very specific story in and of itself as well. It's a deliberate kindness project that I started when I lived in Los Angeles 15 years ago when I was visiting Ken often. And it is something that I've recently repeated here within a group community that I have on Facebook called Sparkle Circle as well. Okay, perfect. Well, man, you you really said that perfectly. So I think everybody <laughs> watching the recording will go to 32favors.com slash Nancy hyphen read just fine. And I just typed it in the chat also on uh, for our live viewers. And I'm at the website right now looking at it. It's beautiful. I like your uh, one through four links right here. And uh, <laughs> yes, it's going to be a great value for everybody who goes there. And I see that you have a uh, an email list as well. So I want you all to go here, subscribe to her on uh, her email list and go to all of her links. Um, I'm going to do that as well. I like what you have to say about being aligned on every level. Um, mm -hmm. I think we all could use more of that. Right. And, uh, that's that, that comes from doing the work. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yes, thank you so much for sharing that. And, um, okay. So we can open it for questions and, um, and also, is there anything else you wanted to add, Nancy? Mm, just, I'm so grateful for being here. And the one thing that I would say is 
after all the time that I spent with Ken and now after all the years that, you know, he, he transitioned in, in, in form that I feel that the greatest takeaway is that it's about taking yourself lighter, not mm. more seriously. Mm -hmm. And that it's not about working at being a good student. It's about remembering that all the times that you resist it to bring that kindness and that compassion and that curiosity rather than that judgment into it and recognize that if the fear is too great at this moment, it doesn't mean you're less spiritual because as long as you're taking a breath every 20 seconds, then all of us are experiencing some form of specialness, right? So we can just get that off the table and not have to try to be striving for something. Jesus doesn't say that we need to give up our specialness. He just says that if we choose this path, we can look at our attraction and our desire to maintain it, but we don't have to feel guilt over aligning with that decision of specialness. And we don't have to annihilate it because if we annihilate it or go to war with it, then what we're really giving it is a power that it doesn't have. And that instead, when we can look lightly at our ego, and like Ken said that the greatest trinity is actually tickling your ego tenderly, smiling at it sweetly, and giggling at it gently. But don't take it seriously. And don't go to war with it. And don't try to be best friends with it. Just allow it to be as it is without judgment. And that for me has been the most healing and the most helpful. Awesome. Man, I love hearing you. You you speak it so well. I I'm <laughs> excited to um to get more into your content because yeah, thank you for your eloquent way of, of saying it. Uh it, it makes me happy and it makes me like hopeful, right? As as a student to be able to do that and do that more. So thank you for the reminders. So let's open it up for questions. This is your chance to ask Nancy a question. Please raise your hand like just like this, or you can also hit the raise <laughs> your hand button. Um, who wants to go first? I think we should have Leslie from LA go first because she's the one who brought you here. If it wasn't for you, Leslie, we would not have this call. So I wanna give everybody, give Leslie some snaps and hearts. If you're happy about this call, Give her all the snaps and hearts right now. Um, Lisa, um, go ahead. Yeah, I don't really have a question, but um, I'm definitely going to check out your book because that perfectionism is something that I've shared quite a bit about on our on our Zoom calls when we, we share our, our, um, our forgiveness in the field, we call it, you know, how we're dealing, how we're bringing the course to our, our uh, imagined lives. Um, I guess, you know, if anything, if you wouldn't mind sharing another story, I like hearing your stories. That would be just great. <laughs> I'd love that. <laughs> Thank sure. you for being here. <laughs> so a story of just about my experiences with The Course of Miracles. Okay. So one of the really powerful stories, again, it, it does involve Ken. And it was when I was giving birth to my miracle baby girl. And that was, gosh, almost seven and a half years ago now, which I still can't believe. And I was on the table and I was having this, you know, C-section. I have a very weird anatomy and that's part of why it was kind of the miracle baby. But as I was having this C-section, I <laughs> started hemorrhaging. And they got the baby out and they took her off to the NICU. So thank goodness they were paying attention to her. But once all the focus was on her, they weren't really paying attention to me much. <laughs> and so I started to bleed out. And as I was bleeding out, I had yet another near-death experience <laughs> where I was listening in the background. Because when I was at the, the surgery for the, the C-section, they asked me if I wanted to listen to anything in the background. And I was like, oh yeah, I want to listen to Ken, right? So I had them playing at one of his academy classes on kindness. 
And they were like, this is weird. Like, what are we, what are we even listening to? And I said, oh, it's one of my mentors. And, you know, he passed away a few years ago. And, and, and this is something that'll really make, stay, keep me calm. And they're like, okay, great. So they were playing it in the background. So I'm hearing Ken's voice as all this is happening <laughs> and, 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 you know, all this activity is going on. I'm not knowing that I'm bleeding out, but I'm starting to get really, really, really cold. So about a year before I had my baby, I had had this very lucid prophetic dream. I've always been a really lucid dreamer. And in my dream, I heard this voice that asked me, would you give your life for hers? And I was like, uh, yes. And I, I, I said, yes. And in my dream, the baby was born and then I died. And I actually felt myself like, you know, drift away and, and it was, it was over quote unquote. And then I woke up and I was like, well, that's really weird. Cause I'm not pregnant. And then it was probably about four or five months later that I became pregnant. And I knew from that first instant, oh, it's a girl. And I thought, okay, well, maybe this is my next chapter. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm just going through this. And, 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 and so when they said it was an actual girl, I was like, yep, knew that. And then I felt even more kind of, you know, sad and also happy at the same time. It was like, like, well, okay. So am I, am I, am I just agreeing that I'm, I'm done here? Like, is, is this it? And, and I didn't think I'd ever be a mother. And um, so I didn't tell a single soul other than I think maybe my one best friend about this dream that I had had. And she was like, oh, people have all kinds of dreams or whatever, you know? And I said, yeah, but a lot of my dreams have come true. And, 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 and so I don't know why, but I'm just going to go forward. And as long as the baby doesn't say no, I'm not either. So I'm just going to go through the pregnancy. And it was a very, very, very complicated pregnancy. And so here I am at the very end, getting excited that I'm going to meet this girl, this you know, adorable little baby. And, and then I basically have this sensation of getting colder and colder and colder because the blood was, you know, coming out and they took the baby off to the NICU. And I was like, okay, the baby's okay. She made it. Maybe that's all I'm supposed to do. And, and, and then while I was having this experience of getting colder and colder and colder, and I'm listening to Ken's voice in the background, I hear that same voice that I had in my dream ask me, will you give your life for hers? And I said the same thing that I said in my dream. And I said, yes. And I thought, okay, this is it. I'm, I, I did my part for whatever reason. I was like this vessel and I delivered this baby. And, 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 and I, this was a tremendous classroom for me because I had no control over what my body was doing or how it was, you know, showing up pregnant or anything like that. But I only got to choose how I wanted to see what was unfolding. And I did have control over my mind and I did the best I could. <laughs> I wasn't perfect. It was really, really, really hard, but I did the best I could. And so I, I said, yes. And I was preparing to just let go. And I was like so sad because I was thinking, oh, this little girl, she's never going to know how much I loved her. And, and, and she's not going to ever have met her mother, right? You know, all these things that, that start going through our head, believing very much that I was a body at that point, right? So I wasn't denying it. I, I was feeling every little bit of this. And then the same question came, but this time it was Ken's voice. And he said, will you give your life for hers? And I said again, yes. And he said, but Nancy, you don't have to. And he said that true love doesn't require sacrifice. It's a choice made once experienced as eternity. And then from that, I felt a little bit warmer and I heard the anesthesiologist voice next to me. And she was like, oh no, you don't. She recognized what was happening. And she jabbed this needle into my shoulder that stopped the bleeding. And I survived. And I got to meet my little girl and now she's seven and a half. And I took those words with me about what true love really is. And it doesn't require sacrifice. And that was one of the greatest gifts. And, and I, I, I truly feel as though when all that was happening, that I could feel his hand and the presence of him being there with me. Wow. And so that is another story. What a great story. 
Thank you so much for sharing that, Nancy. <laughs> and thank you, Leslie, for asking such a great question. I just have to say that was beautiful and it moved me to tears. Thank you so much for that. That was beautiful. Thank you. And so tell us about your daughter. <laughs> She's amazing. She's seven and a half. She's in first grade. And she is, yeah, she's just incredible. She's this little, little light and, and she loves everybody. She's the kindest little soul. And she is so just, yeah, the biggest, the biggest blessing. And that has been the biggest classroom for me in real kindness is, is, is being a mom and, and forgiving myself for not doing it perfectly for, <laughs> for, 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 you know, losing it at times for forgetting all the things that that blue book, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah. it talks about and, and then forgiving myself and then starting mm -hmm. over and, and, and not taking her pain personally, you know, recognizing mm -hmm. that she's this little person and also has a full blown ego and that it's not up to me to deny her that experience. You know, I know, I know that might be controversial to some people, but I really strongly feel that if we don't know what we're choosing against, then how can we really make a conscious choice, right? So if we haven't experienced all the things with our ego to then choose at some point, if that's something that she wants to do in her life. And, you know, she knows that I have this blue book on the paper. She's heard about Ken kind of as this grandpa figure, like, you know, and, and playing in the background or something like that. So I'm sure that, that there's no accident in the fact that she's my daughter and that there may or may not be some curiosity within that. But I want her to have her childhood and to be normal and, and to have that experience. And so that has been very, very, very crucial for me as her mother is that again, I can be here, but not of here. I can be her mom, but not of, you know, the, the motherhood, like according to the world too. And so that means that if I'm coming from a place of remembering that there is no urgency and that salvation is here already, then I don't need to worry about forcing her or presenting something to her just to make me feel more okay you know like that okay i've done my job now I've, I've i've shown her a course of miracles as a child or something like that and so that has been a decision that i've made as her parent beautiful How, didn't ken say that like our job with kids is to let them just develop healthy egos and mm -hmm. just grow into like like be normal and and let this is not a topic for a kid and they maybe let them explore it when they're a little older yeah. or a lot older. Yeah, 100%. It's know? just like with my mom. Yeah. I mean, she never, ever, ever tried to get me to read anything or talked about it or, you know, tried to make me feel bad. If I was sick, she didn't come in and go, oh, you know, you're not a body. And so, mm -hmm. you know, Ken would always say that sometimes some of the most unkind, cruel people were Course in Miracles students that were misdirected and that felt that they should go to a funeral and tell people, hey, you don't need to be sad that there's not a body here <laughs> and that they thought they were being loving. And it's not that they're bad. It's just that it's misdirected. And mm. it's, it's, it's about meeting people where they are. And again, when you're not coming from a sense of urgency or that I need to get others to be different, then you don't feel that sense to have to try to have people be different. And so you can sit with somebody. I've sat with people that, you know, they believe very strongly in like the Torah or in areas of the Bible or something like that. I can hold space with them. I don't have to believe what they're saying, but if it offers them comfort, then I have nothing to lose by being there with them and holding that space for them in a way that's meaningful to them. No, I don't have to go out and believe everything they're saying. And I don't have to change, you know, my decisions about things or anything like that, but I can be open. And I can sit there because I don't need them to be different. And, and so I get to sit there and, and hold that communionship with them of seeing us as the same and remembering that I'm either walking together as one or not at all. Mm -hmm. Shared interest, shared purpose, shared mm -hmm. identity. Absolutely. 
Beautiful answer. Thank you so much. And our last question comes from Terry Wade in San Francisco. She asks, how do you keep peace and remain loving when someone is being unkind to you? Mm. Well, that's a great question, Terry. And the thing is, is that yes, the workbook says in lesson five and 34 that I'm never upset for the reason I think and that I can see peace instead of this. And yet it also says, don't deny what you're feeling, right? In my defenselessness, my safety lies. And so when someone is quote unquote, being unkind to you, it's not about getting them to be different. And it's not about denying your experience, but it is asking yourself, what does this really have to do with me? Right. As that loving thought in the mind of God. Now, when you recognize that you're still that oneness joined as one, that not one note in heaven's song has been missed. And that goes the same for this other person or for this inanimate object, because it's all or nothing. So it goes for your coffee maker that seems to be on the fritz, you know, in the morning <laughs> that you think being mad at is, is not a big deal. And it's not a big deal, but it doesn't say don't get angry. It just says, don't justify it. Right. So, 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 so let yourself feel whatever you're going to feel. And then also recognize that having somebody being unkind to you in this world or being kind to you in this world is the same in the fact that they're both unreal and that you get to choose how to interpret something. And when you're resting in that place of knowing that you're still that oneness joined as one, beyond time and space, everything else, then that allows you as your seeming body to do whatever it is that's gonna be the most helpful and healing to the situation. So it could be that you're gonna be extremely busy, that you're gonna be setting some boundaries, that you're gonna be saying no, that you're gonna be you know, maybe limiting some relationships, but you're not gonna be coming from fear. You're not gonna be coming from hate. You're going to be coming from a choice to remember that everything is connected and everything is always already that oneness. And so now whatever the body does or doesn't do isn't about the thing that seemed to happen. It's more about a demonstration of whose hand you're holding as you're experiencing what you're experiencing. So it's like, number one, don't deny Number two, know that when we're willing to surrender our ego's interpretation and instead ask the Holy Spirit to help us to see what's really there, that then options become available, maybe not in that instant, but they become available to us that we're no longer limiting or trying to manage the situation. So we're not trying to say that help me choose between X, Y, and Z. We're instead saying, help me to look at this differently. And that whenever we feel mistreated by anybody else, that's that terrible line, right? Behold me, brother, behold me, brother, at your hand I die. And so really it's just us wanting to maintain our face of innocence at the cost of everyone else being the guilty party. And so does that mean that you condone negative behavior or somebody being abusive or unkind? Not at all. So it's never about the form, it's always about the content. And when your mind is more aligned with that content of oneness and unity, then your body will do whatever it's going to do. That's the most loving and helpful and demonstrative of that oneness for that specific situation. Beautifully said. And uh, a call for love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And you don't have to take their ego seriously. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you don't respond to it, but you're not responsible for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get to take care of you, quote unquote, but in your mind, you still see you as a part of everything rather than apart from everyone and everything. Mm, that's a great way to say it. Part of everything instead of apart from everything. Awesome. Well, thank you, Nancy. Great answer. Thank you for the question, Terry. 
Um, I'm definitely going to be watching this recording again and <laughs> just hearing it all again, the way you speak um, the metaphysics of the course is so beautiful and uh, so deeply understood and e eloquent. And uh, I really appreciate the time you took out of your, your schedule on a Friday night to be with us. I <laughs> uh, really do appreciate it. And um, before before I uh, pass it back to you for your final words of, of advice for everyone, I do want to invite everyone watching to come find us on Facebook. We're called Living a Course in Miracles, and we are a Facebook group. So if you go into Facebook and you look us up, you can hit join group and we'll add you right in. We study the works of Ken Wapnick every Friday night, and we are currently on Journey Through the Workbook. And we post this in like a little... Um, featured post. So you can see what we're studying. We do 30 minutes at a time. We share our highlights and then we share our forgiveness in the field. So it's a great community of people that are really excited about A Course in Miracles and specifically the teachings of Ken Wapnick and how uh, he he basically presents it because it's just so clear and so valuable. So I want to invite all of you to come and find us on YouTube and uh, and also go to Nancy, uh, go to Nancy's link that will be in the description of this YouTube video, the 32 favors link. Uh, so you don't have to go and rewind it. You can just hit, hit, uh, see more and hit, have the link right there in the YouTube. So Nancy, thank you again for being here. It has been a pleasure to, to have you. And, uh, can you please end the call with your last piece of advice? <laughs> yes. Just take yourself lightly and everyone else. And that doesn't mean deny anything. But it means to remember that there's always more available when you're willing to surrender your interpretation as the ego and instead to invite the Holy Spirit, which isn't a part from you. It is a part of you. It is that highest expression of you on that ladder, you know, quote unquote. But it seems as though it's separate from us. And so if anything spoke to you today or you have any other questions that you want to explore, please connect with me and I would love to get to explore that with you. Ooh, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Nancy. Let's take a group picture. Everyone who's <laughs> watching live, turn on your cameras. We're going to take a picture with Nancy. We'll post it in our Facebook group. Now I will say that if you don't turn on your camera, it's okay, but we're only going <laughs> to, um, we're going to hide non-video participants. So it's only going to be people with their camera on will be in this picture. Okay. I see you BJ, Terry, Steven, Wendy, Christian, Kelly, Patsy, and Leesley. Okay. Everyone smile. Look at the camera and five, four, three, two, smile. All right. Beautiful. We will post that. Thank you again, Nancy. It's been a pleasure and an honor sending you all our love and hugs. Everybody give Nancy some hearts and some snaps one more time. And let's <laughs> unmute the lines and say good night and God bless. 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 Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Good night, God bless. Thank you, Thank you, good night, Nancy. God bless. It's beautiful. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye.